Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Please welcome to the stage, Daryl Irvine. All right, welcome back. Um, President Reif started his remarks this morning noting um, how one of the main ways that MIT has impact is by really marrying science and engineering, and that resonates strongly with me. Uh, my lab is a collection of uh, engineers, chemists, material scientists, bioengineers, biologists, and immunologists um, working together to develop new technologies to treat uh, disease with a particular focus on the immune system. Um, we're, we're fascinated by the immune system, which is this distributed network of um, local immune command centers known as lymph nodes um, that are distributed throughout your body, uh, together with a collection of cells, T cells, B cells, innate immune cells that circulate throughout your blood and enter all tissues to monitor and uh, protect you against disease. And so the immune system, of course, has a critical role in protecting us from all kinds of infectious, infectious disease, bacterial, fungal, parasitic infections. Um, the immune system also plays an important role in wound healing. And we now are beginning to appreciate the immune system's ability to survey and, in some cases, protect us from developing cancers. So all of these are, are fascinating um, disease-related protective roles of the immune system that we might like to augment and, and build on. Um, but the immune system being this powerful force for good can also, in some cases, um, go wrong. And, it's and the dysfunction of the immune system is implicated in many diseases like autoimmune diabetes, multiple sclerosis, atherosclerosis, graft versus host disease, allergies, and so on. And so what really drives us and gets us out of bed in the morning is asking the question, what if we could engineer the immune system to better either control these uh, situations of disease, to drive the immune system to be better able to uh, eliminate infectious disease or cancer? Um, can we develop technologies to better understand what the immune system is doing in humans? Um, and I'm just going to focus on one uh, particular vignette to, to give you some flavor of how we as engineers are working on these problems in uh, immunotherapy. And that comes, this example comes from the world of cancer immunotherapy. So um, you'd probably have to be living under a rock to have not heard something about this excitement in the world of what's called immune oncology, drugs that act on your immune system to fight cancer. And the excitement all comes from um, this graph uh, up at, at the top here, where on the left, what usually happens when we treat cancer patients with chemotherapy or surgery or radiation is that they gain some short-term benefit and survival, but ultimately everyone succumbs to disease at, at, at the end of the day. By contrast, we've now discovered a few immunotherapy treatments that have this entirely different shape to the curve that have what people call the tail of the curve here, which is a small fraction of patients that actually become long-term survivors. And for a couple of these treatments, uh, people living 10 years, 15 years um, past when they would be expected to have succumbed to disease. And this has led to a lot of uh, excitement in the basic science and a lot of an explosion of new drug approvals. And really what's happening is we finally understand enough about the human immune system that we can now start rationally designing treatments that act upon it. And I want to tell you a story that relates to one of these very promising treatments called adoptive T cell therapy. So this uh, started many years ago, more than 20 years ago, um, with the idea that you could isolate um, immune cells, T cells, from tumor biopsies of a patient, grow those T cells from the patient up to large numbers in cell culture, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th cells, and show that they could still recognize and kill the patient's tumor and then take that expanded army of T cells, reinfuse them into the patient in hopes that they would hunt down and destroy metastatic disease. And um, this has now been expanded to an even more elegant approach where you take any T cell out of the patient and you genetically introduce an artificial T cell receptor that allows any T cell to become an anti-tumor T cell. 
And this is being now trialed in a whole host of um, both hematologic cancers and solid tumors. And it's led to some really dramatic anecdotal results, as, as I'm showing here. This is data from the National Cancer Institute. Um, patients with melanoma with these large lesions that two weeks after transfer infusion of T cells, their own T cells, those lesions are melting away. Um, patients who have visceral liver metastases that 30 days after T cell therapy, the, the metastases are gone. Three years later, that patient is still in a complete remission. So this is what gets everyone excited. Now, unfortunately, the overall picture, if we just plot survival, uh, and this is melanoma patients largely, uh, uh, of patients over time, only about 20 to 25 percent of the patients receiving this T cell therapy are becoming these complete responders with long-term survival. So the question has, has really focused on how do we make more patients respond to this kind of very promising therapy? And one of the reasons, that, one of the things that holds back the T cells that we infuse into these patients is if this is my T cell crawling into a tumor uh, microenvironment, that T cell is immediately bombarded with a whole host of immunosuppressive signals coming from the tumor microenvironment, the fact that it's hypoxic, um, host immune cells that the tumor is co-opting to protect itself from attack. Basically, all of the strategies that the immune system uses to turn itself off at the end of a successful immune response, the tumor uses to protect itself from immune attack. And so we're looking for ways to overcome that. And about um, 10 years ago now, we started down the road of imagining a strategy where we take very potent immunomodulatory drugs that could protect T cells from this microenvironment, and instead of infusing them systemically into a patient, because the problem with systemic treatment of these immunomodulators is they're going to act on every cell in the body and potentially cause lethal toxicity if we're just activating immune cells everywhere. We want to activate only the T cells that are going after the tumor. And so the way we envision doing this is, is backpacking drugs on the surface of the T cell, designing a nanoparticle that carries a drug that's meant to act either back on the carrier cell, this is what we would call it, a, an autocrine signaling loop, where drugs are released from this uh, little suitcase uh, attached to the cell surface and bind back to the cell's own receptors, or that cell could be delivering drugs meant for other cells in the tumor microenvironment, maybe delivering chemotherapy to the tumor cells. And um, we've been now developing this for a number of years. And I just want to show you sort of the current evolution of how we do this and how we think about moving this into the clinic. So it starts from choosing a drug. And there are a number of uh, protein drugs uh, known as cytokines, especially interleukins, that are particularly potent in promoting T cell function and protecting them from these immunosuppressive signals. And we've developed a strategy where we polymerize these drugs with copies of themselves to form a nanoparticle which is essentially made out of the drug. In material science terms, this is a protein hydrogel that's formed by linking copies of the drug to other copies of the drug through this reversible crosslinker. And the reason we do this is this allows us to make a, a particle that's about um, 100 nanometers in size that can now, uh, a, a tiny fraction of the size of the cell, that can now be chemically linked to the cell surface. We actually anchor to cell surface proteins on the T cell. But we further now engineer this uh, nanoparticle backpack to respond to what the T cell's doing, because we don't want the drug to release everywhere in the body. We want the drug to specifically stimulate the cell when it finds the tumor. And the way we do that is that we design the backpack to actually respond to the biology of the cell when it sees the tumor. So if a T cell encounters a tumor cell and recognizes it through its T cell receptor, that delivers a signal into the T cell that triggers upregulation of an enzyme on the cell surface. And we actually design the backpack to dissolve in response to the action of that enzyme. And that released protein then binds back to cell surface receptors. And that is what then supercharges our cell to be able to go after and attack the tumor. So the backpack is carried by the cell into the tumor and then specifically releases the drug when um, the T cell sees its target. But there are a lot of other fascinating things that we've discovered along the way as we've started engineering cells in this way. So when we um, decorate T cells with these backpack payloads, they, you can see these particles decorated over the cell surface, they actually get carried with the cell surface receptor wherever that cell goes and whatever it's doing. And so 
when these T cells um, enter a tissue, they take on this hand mirror morphology. And you see these are individual T cells migrating through a collagen matrix in cell culture that we can image with a microscope. And these blue flashlights that you see on the tail of each cell are actually a cluster of these nanoparticles that have been moved to the rear of the cell because that's where it carries those receptors. And so it actually uh, benefits us that the, that the backpack payload is sort of carried out of the way at the back end of the cell. But when that T cell encounters a tumor cell, as I'm showing in this movie down here, this is a tumor cell in green and a T cell with the backpacks in blue. And over about a, an hour of real time, these backpacks start moving into the interface. And you see these blue speckles here, the, the early stages of the, the T cell essentially moving all of those particles into that interface. And that now allows us to actually use that biology that the T cell moves its receptors into the interface as a way to deliver drugs to the tumor cell, if, if that's what we're, what we're after. Um, now, an important aspect of this is we're, we're chemically modifying these cells, but we still want them to be able to do all the things they need to do in vivo, to traffic to tissues, to find tumors, to be able to recognize and kill tumor cells. And I'll just show you one of the powerful things that comes from this technology in terms of delivering the drug where we want it to go. So um, this is a mouse model of prostate cancer where we inject T cells into these mice and they find their way to the prostate tumor and infiltrate it. And we use a technique where we can image in the live animal where these cells are going through bioluminescence imaging that's shown in this rainbow false color scale. It tells us where the T cells are. So after injection, uh, after three days after we inject the T cells, they're going to the prostate tumors, and they're also still in some lymphoid organs. And if we nanoparticle decorate them, they still go to the prostate. Um, but it, excitingly, if we separately image where the nanoparticles went, if we just inject free nanoparticles into these mice, they mostly go to the liver and spleen, and essentially none of them make it their way to the tumor. This is the excised tumor from the animals. Um, the T cells alone, of course, there's no nanoparticles. But the T cells that were backpacked with this particle cargo actually carry it actively into the tissue. And even without dissecting up the tumor, we can see that signal that shows that they've completely changed where the nanoparticle gets to. Instead of uh, not making it to the tumor at all, we see it strongly accumulating there. And this has a major impact on then the outcome of T cell therapy. So, and this is a, a mouse model of melanoma lung metastasis. So in this first column, you're looking at images of mice that have growing lung metastases of melanoma. And then in this next series of panel, we're imaging over days the fate of T cells that we've injected into these mice that we can separately track. So if we inject T cells alone that are meant to go after and kill that tumor, um, the T cells go to the tumor sites, they have a little bit of anti-tumor activity, and then they quickly die out because they're being immunosuppressed. This is the animal model equivalent of this problem I talked about in human cancer. If we inject two supporting drugs, interleukin-21 and interleukin-15, that are meant to keep the T cells going, it doesn't really change the picture all that much. The T cells go to the tumor, they proliferate a little bit, and then they die away. But if we take the same dose of these two drugs, and now we backpack it on the cells instead of injecting it systemically, so that each cell is carrying its own dose of drug wherever it traffics in the body, now instead of dying out, the T cells expand massively. They eliminate all of the tumor cells in this mouse. And then they quiesce, and they become long-lived memory cells that will protect the animal from any recurrence. And that, what that looks like for survival is, um, in the traditional case, if we just give T cell therapy, the animals only live a few days longer than if we left them completely untreated. But if we transfer in these backpack cells, um, they completely eliminate the metastatic burden. These animals become 100% uh, long-term survivors. So this is, as I said, we've been working on this about 10 years now. And um, by working through the best animal models we have, and of course, as Linda mentioned at the uh, morning session, we're not trying to cure mice, we're trying to cure humans. And so now um, we're trying to leverage um, this incredible ecosystem around MIT, and this has now been um, translated out to a startup company that I co-founded called Torque, actually supported in part by Nubar's um, company flagship. Uh, which is taking all of the important steps, taking the things that we do in the lab, working with cells and test tubes and culture plates, and moving into automated devices that will allow you to treat um, thousands of patients at scale 
and do, uh, take this complex back, nanoparticle backpack technology and move it into human testing. And we're looking to see this actually for, uh, first in humans um, next year. And I think there's a lot of exciting uh, potential around this general concept of engineering cells with synthetic materials, with uh, materials chemistry and biotechnology. We're already thinking about other immune cells that we could manipulate. We can make natural killer cells that work better. Regulatory T cells that could suppress graft-versus-host disease or help transplant uh, recipients not reject their um, tissues. Um, stem cells so that we could have better engraftment of stem cells following a bone marrow transplant. And these uh, ideas could be translated to a variety of infectious disease, uh, diabetes, autoimmunity, and, and so forth. And, and these are all things that I think are in the near-term horizon uh, that are well within uh, the technological capabilities that we have currently. Um, so I'll stop there and just acknowledge that this uh, was work led uh, by a, a very talented postdoc in the lab, uh, Matthias Stefan, who started this work 10 years ago, led on by a second postdoc, Lee Tang, um, and we're grateful for support from the NIH and a variety of sources for this research. Thanks. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.